Hello, everyone. This is Sanjeev Goel, conference chair for IIT 2020. And today I have Ranveer Chandra with me. And uh, Ranveer uh, doesn't need an introduction. He is, uh, he heads Microsoft Azure and uh, he has 100 patents. He is an IIT KGP alum and a phenomenal guy. And uh, we are looking forward to talk to him. So Ranveer, why don't you share a little bit about yourself that give your, us an idea about your journey, especially in the last 20 years? Yeah, very nice to meet you, Sanjeev. So my background is, uh, I did my undergrad from IIT Kharagpur in computer science in 95. After that, I did my PhD from Cornell, uh, graduated from, with a PhD in 2005. So 99 to 2005, I was at Cornell. And of 2005 is after I graduated, I would have become an academic. I interviewed in all ac academic places. I had an offer from UT Austin, but instead of going there, I decided to come to Microsoft. This was the only industry place I interviewed in. I came here in 2005 in Microsoft research. Since then, since 2005 to 2018, I was doing different things in research. I was doing research on new networking technologies. If you're using the Xbox One, I designed the Xbox One wireless controller protocol. I did a lot of work on batteries. So one of the things in Microsoft research that I did was every five years, I started a longer term project within Microsoft. So in 2005, I started a project called TV White Spaces, which uses unused TV channels to send and receive data. 2010. So on that. Yeah, that's a very important one. And I'm sorry, uh, that's very fascinating because you have used the technology. I watched several videos around white space. So I really get excited when you talk about white space. So can you go a little bit deeper into that? What it really means to our audience, basically? Yeah, so with the TV white spaces, imagine if you have a Wi-Fi router and you could go several miles. Right now, as soon as you exit your house, your Wi-Fi disappears. Imagine if you could go several miles. And the way we did that was we took a Wi-Fi signal and we put it in empty TV channels. This is TV you watch using over the air antennas. Many of you would remember these antennas that you had on the rooftop and you moved it to get the signal. You know, when you browse through TV on certain channels, you get a transmission. The other channels, all you see is white noise. There's nothing coming there. The technology we built was a way to take, say, a Wi-Fi signal to put in these noisy TV channels so that it doesn't interfere with your TV reception in an adjacent channel. So you could be watching channel seven at home. On channel eight, we could be sending Wi-Fi signals. And the reason this is so cool is that compared to Wi-Fi, at the same power level, in UHF TV channels, your signals go four times farther. In VHF, they go 12 times farther. And this is in free space. Once you put in trees, crops, canopies, buildings, your signals just keep going through. So this is the technology. Of course, this is at a very high level. We wrote multiple papers on this. The FCC chairman, had come back in the day to see the demo we had put together. This was made legal in the US. This has since then been made, been made legal in various countries worldwide. But that's the technology. Essentially, what we want to do is to make, uh, to bring internet connectivity everywhere to solve the digital divide. So since 2010, that it became legal, we've connected high schools, hospitals, dispensaries in various parts of the world using this technology in Africa, in India, in Southeast Asia. So that's this technology, one of the technologies that I worked on. So I have a question on that. I was reading it and you know, I'm a geek, so is uh, most of our audience. I understand the concept of uh, receiving signals, right? So it's a one way. How you make it like uh, in and out, because in internet there is a request and there is a response. So how do you create that with the, this technology? Yeah, so the way this works is like you have a Wi-Fi router and you have a phone. Imagine, or you have a cell phone base station and you have a phone. Imagine if both of them, instead of operating in cell tower frequencies, they were operating in the TV channels instead. So then you would be doing both way communications. It's not just downlink, but your device, your phone or your laptop would have a separate radio and an antenna and it could be sending data using that frequencies. Wow. Yeah. Wow, oh, that's brilliant. That's phenomenal. So in, in a way, can I say that it is going to beat a Starlink too or no? We are far from there. Can it be? The... Can it beat a Starlink? Uh, Elon Musk is really pushing it and there are a lot of, uh, he's making huge investment. 
Starlink is very interesting. It's using satellite connectivity. And uh, that's one of the ways in which you could connect. This is complementary. So Starlink, what it does is it uses satellites, low Earth orbit satellites, to connect downstream. Imagine if it gets to one point, and then you have TV wide spaces to send it to the next 20, 30 miles from there. So this is the vision that we think. Um, and we are working with Starlink. We are working with other companies that, that do satellite connectivity. So it's pretty much like last mile connectivity when we talk about the villages, when we talk about uh, uh, even towns and other areas uh, where you can really get a better connection with the, uh, at a, in the rural areas. How about yeah. urban areas? Do you see this is going to solve the problem of urban areas too? This could solve the problem of urban areas as well. It's complementary. So rather than thinking of it in isolation, we should think, it, think of this in conjunction with the other spectrum, say millimeter wave in 5G or any of the other spectrum that exists. This is very complementary to that because what this will do is this stretches over several miles. Wow. While others, what they would do is they would do it in a very small space. Like we hear about 5G. In yeah. 5G, we talk about gigabit per second speeds. How do you get to gigabit per second speeds? One way to do that is do very short range communication. So I'll have say put in the mall and I'll use wide frequencies and millimeter wave and very short range. But at the same time, there are other scenarios where you want long range connectivity. Like for example, if I'm going in a uh, driving somewhere or things like that. So then you could use this as a handoff mechanism in urban areas. The other benefit that we found in urban areas is for warehouses or big buildings. Like if I have a warehouse, signals don't travel very well. This feels, yeah, this is an ideal frequency for that domain as well. Interesting, very interesting. So wh what is, the, what is uh, the challenge? Why there is no universal adoption of technology like this? Because the band is already available. Everybody yeah. pretty much have this infrastructure, so. Yeah, it will happen. I think this is the concept which we are calling dynamic spectrum access. Until now, worldwide, every spectrum regulator auctions their frequencies. As you know, in India, the auction, yeah. 2G auction, 4G, 5G auction. What that means is you have an auction and that entire band is reserved for the, bid, the winner of the auction. But right. what if that frequency is never used? Now you can envision a future where even though certain frequencies have been allocated for certain purposes, if no one's using it, it's used by others. Like in this case, in the TV white spaces, it's allocated for TV, but if there is no TV broadcast, you can use it for wireless communication. And this is a concept that's slowly being adopted by the FCC and UK and some of the developed regions, and I'm expecting in the future it will get everywhere. And some of the countries in the developing regions are adopting this. And I'm seeing more adoption, like the TV white spaces. It's now legal in South Africa, in Kenya, in Malawi, which is one of the poorest countries in the world. So it's happening. It's happening. It could be faster, but as with Spectrum, for example, it's a touchy issue sometimes. Sure. But I think it will get adopted. So, uh, Rohit, a uh, bolt-on question to that is when we talk about uh, uh, connectivity, that is everything today. We know that. With 5G, we know that the problem is the distance. You're putting towers pretty much like every single nook and corner. And a lot of interesting challenges with that. But uh, to come back to the white space technology, and uh, you have done a lot of work in uh, virtual Wi-Fi, just million plus download of uh, that application even. My question is, what do you see? Uh, so for example, uh, we have challenges, especially natural catastrophe. Uh, what happened in, uh, in Florida, we had those challenges. Do you see application of your technology even in that? Yeah, yeah, we do such deployments, especially in disaster scenarios where you have, like the infrastructure is just gone, right? Like for example, it happened in Puerto Rico in the hurricanes last year. And then we immediately sent our people there, we sent the equipment and you could very quickly fire up a network, connecting the, connecting the people, connecting the rescue workers who need connectivity too to coordinate where to go. We did this in the floods in New Orleans. So we do this as well. And I think that's another use case of a very quick deployment of a network. Now, of course, there's a lot more to be done. Do you need Sorry? a special radio for this or uh, the regular phone works with that? No, you need a special radio. But that's where we expect that these radios will become pervasive. There is a Wi-Fi standard called 802.11 AF. This is a yeah, Wi-Fi 
that can do multiple frequencies, including the TV wide space. Oh, so we envision wow. a future where this will just be embedded in every every device. In fact, why just TV spectrum, right? I think in the future you'll have these chipsets that can go the entire spectrum. And yeah, but that's a vision of the future. That's a researcher in me talking. <laughs> no, but extending it further, Rohit, uh, because connectivity is everything. We know that, and if we can figure out a way how we can harness solar. It's, it's the biggest thing. And uh, there was uh, a technology I was hearing a lot about is Li-Fi for longest time. And I don't hear that much. So what happened to that? Yeah, so Li-Fi is using light, right? So LED right. is Wi-Fi. And that is very good for in-home, in-room communication. Like I have a light on top. Can the bulbs communicate with my phone? It can do high speed transfers. But I think the key challenge there is you need both ends to be modified. And the reason was that in many cases, you have good Wi-Fi in the house. Although I still think there are many use cases of Wi-Fi. It might come up where you really need very high bandwidth. And for example, you can think of manufacturing floors or things like that too, where it might be a very useful technology. So this is the thing with technology. Usually it takes a cycle for it to take off. Like Wi-Fi, for example, it was invented in the early 90s. It didn't really take off until the mid 2000s. So I think we have to be patient to see it take off. Same with Li-Fi. I think it got the hype, it got the a lot of buzz. Now there is a lull in that. I think it will come back. I think there are use cases where Li-Fi would be a very interesting uh, technology to use. So, so Ranveer, is it with new technolo technology, is it that like we, like we saw with internet, that you, you really need government support to to propagate any new technology among the masses. Is it true still that if you come up with any new thing, you really need the government's backing you to, to make it, uh, uh, democratize it basically? That's an interesting point, Puneet. I think spectrum is, a, is seen as a national resource. So if it's a national resource, it's the government has a role to play in how it's distributed, who has access to it. So at the spectrum layer, the allocation is a government role. And so you will need the government to support it. But beyond the spectrum access, the actual technology, like for example, if we are talking of 3GPP or Wi-Fi or Li-Fi, these standards that sit on top, these are built by private sector, public sector organizations without government interference. So the role of the government should be to keep it as limited as possible, as minimal uh, inter interference into the entire space, but while making sure that it's not misused. And that is why this concept of dynamic spectrum access, for example, rather than having spectrum being dedicated for a certain use, using software, like for example, in the future, your phone, rather than having dedicated spectrum, it could say, I am sitting in Seattle. It would communicate to the web servers, which would say, if you're in Seattle, you should be using this spectrum to go to this cellular carrier that you have. If you're thinking of that future, then even the government's role in controlling the spectrum access is limited. It doesn't need to auction off all the parts of the spectrum. That's all done in software. This is like when people are talking about software-defined networking, this could be a software-defined spectrum service of the future. That's pretty amazing. That's pretty amazing. We're going to see a pretty different world, uh, it looks like from a decade from now, when we talk about networking, how phones will be connected, how computers will be connected, homes will be connected. IoT comes in and, and, and you get just a boom of connected, connected things on different spectrums. It's, it's pretty so amazing. One thing I would like to say, Ranveer, on that is, first of all, you validate my point. Uh, irrespective of where we see ourselves today, especially, you know, uh, with uh, COVID, there are a lot of challenges. People are struggling and uh, there are a lot of problems we are dealing with, but there are opportunities. There are new frontiers we are going to find and we will go and solve some of these problems uh, in future. So coming back to that is uh, I'll ask the question around uh, white space and uh, why white space. So uh, before we jump to the white space, three of us agree that the, our globally, our population is going to grow. Three billion, four billion, time will tell. And uh, I had a quick uh, call, actually we had a fireside chat with Naveen Jain and we were talking about uh, health. And he is a big proponent that dying is optional, sickness is optional, which is fascinating concept. 
And uh, same way, my friend Dave Esper is doing a lot of work. Peter Demantis is doing a lot of work on longevities. And we are living, I don't know about longer really is because that's a very relative term, but we are living healthier. Uh, we are all doing amazing things. People are hiking mountains at the age of 70, 80, which was never heard of. So we are all in a get better shape. So now the, there is a lot of population. Uh, the earth has a huge demand of resources, on resources, and uh, we all want better quality of life. So how do you see this is going to pan out? And especially when we talk about agro and farm, because uh, you have done a lot of work in that space. Yeah, yeah no, this is a challenge we all need to figure out. How are we going to feed the world? That is, there's so many more people, as you said, and their food habits are changing because people are more and more people are moving to cities. They're earning more. They want more food. It's not just about more food. You want to give them good food, nutritious food. And you, want to, you need to grow this food without harming the planet. You, the water levels are receding. The soils are not getting any richer. How are you going to grow more food, more nutritious food to feed the planet? And that is a fundamental challenge. We all need to rally behind this and come up with ways to address the food problem. And in, in my own case, we started this, pro this project called uh, Farm Beats back in 2014, 2015, that time frame. But this is not just, we are still scratching the surface. I think we all need to come together, rally together, bring the best in technology to the food sector, both in terms of digital plus genomics, plus new food tech, lab-grown meats, everything, bring everything together. And we might be able to make a dent and help feed the world. So uh, Rohit, when we talk about um, farm beets, can you help uh, our audience understand what exactly it is and where do you see this technology is going to be in the next five years or 10 years? Yeah, so with farm beets, the key, so when, it, when we talk about the agriculture problem, right? So one of the most promising approaches to address the agriculture problem is that of data-driven agriculture. What we mean by that is, being able to use data to drive a lot of decisions. Right now, when I started this project, even before that, I went and I talked to lots of farmers. In fact, my background is, I did, when growing up, I spent a lot of time in India as well. And when I went over here, when I talked to farmers, what I realized is that every farmer knows a lot about their land. Some farmers, they can touch the sand and they know what's going on. Some farmers, one farmer, he would taste the soil and he could tell what's going on. They know a lot about the farm. But yet, a lot of decisions they make about the farm is based on guesswork. Like how much water do I apply? Where do I apply water? Where do I apply nutrients? Where do I apply pesticide? Is all based on guesswork. So that is what led me to start this project where the key idea was to empower, to, to augment a farmer's knowledge about the farm with data and data-driven insights. So that's what led to the start of the Farm Beats project. Of course, if you think of it, what does it mean, right? You want a farmer to know in real time what's happening with the farm, what's happening right now with data, and using artificial intelligence, predict what's going to happen in the future. How do you do that? Now, this seems like, you know what? We know how to solve IoT problems, right? You do, we put in devices, we can get the data. The challenge with agriculture is that it's very hard to get a lot of data from the middle of the farm. These farms don't have great connectivity, going back to the TV flight spaces issue. These farms, you can't really be putting multiple devices in the farm because that becomes very expensive. Like for yeah. example, suppose the problem was if I have a farm and I want to build a soil moisture map, what is the soil moisture level six inches below the soil? I would need a sensor every 10 meters, but you can't put a sensor every 10 meters. It's going to be expensive to deploy, to manage. It'll come in the way of the farmer. So these were all se several reasons where we needed to come up with a way to significantly bring down the cost of data-driven agriculture solutions. And that's what led to the start of the Farm Beats project. With the Farm Beats project, what we wanted to do was come up with technologies to, to make data-driven agriculture affordable for all growers worldwide. Wow. So, uh, you know, I have spent a lot of time in GIS, GPS space and really researching even satellite imagery and solving these problems before AI. Uh, so, and uh, we were, uh, the big challenge we were facing at that time, even installing one uh, microclimate uh, device 
in each farm was a big challenge. It was a few thousand dollars. And uh, today I know IoT has reduced the price dramatically, but most of the farmers are pretty low tech. Now they can implement some of these technologies if they have expensive crop like grapes or wine, uh, those kind of things. How do you see the world is going to adopt a solution like that? And yeah. uh, the other challenge I personally see it is uh, there's a lot of know-how. So for example, California grows almost 70% of the global almond production. So 70% of the almond comes from California. Is it the uh, right nutritional value? Is it the same nutritional value? I don't know, I'm not an expert of that. Uh, uh, same thing when you go to Israel, they are growing uh, olives in deserts, which is phenomenal. So there are a lot of outlier in my opinion and how they have used technology. So how a person like you going to make uh, these impact so I can take the technology you have and I can put it in a small uh, uh, farm in India or some other place in Africa. How do I do that? Yeah, no, and these are very important questions, Sanjeev. And you mentioned a few thousand dollars for these sensors. It's still not that much better. In fact, when I started this project, there was an expo in UC Davis. Uh, University of California Davis is one of the top institutes in agriculture. And I was there and there was an expo going on and the cheapest sensor package were five sensors for $8,000 and recurring costs. For most growers, what is the ROI? If I buy a sensor, what's the return? Will it really pay off? And so that's a fundamental issue, right? And that's the thing that we are out to address. In fact, when we started the Farm Beast project, we set ourselves a goal. We bring it down by two orders of magnitude. Right? And that's what we want. We want to significantly bring down the cost of these solutions. And towards that, technology such as TV white spaces for connectivity. One of the other things we did was instead of putting multiple sensors in the farm, rather than putting multiple sensors, you put very few sensors and then use remote sensing, like with satellites or with drones, to then map this, to interpolate the data so that with very few sensors, you can start making very detailed maps. And we built this technology and it's actually shipping as part of the product. So these are different things that can bring down the cost of these solutions, right? Of these data-driven agriculture solutions. Of course, you need, to, you need to do much more. In fact, right now, when I talk to people, we shipped the product. Uh, that is when I moved over to Azure as the chief scientist of Azure Global. I took this research onto a product and now we have announced partnerships with Lando Lakes with various companies to take it to, to, take it to the growers. But I think we are still not at the point where we can get farmers, which has say sub one acre farmers, most of the farmers worldwide are like that, and tell them that, hey, we have a solution for you for data-driven agriculture. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things which we are continuing to do research on this. We are continuing to push the boundaries even further, trying to reduce the cost of these solutions for data-driven agriculture. I'll tell you one idea, one, one uh, technology that we just published last year, which, uh, which got the best paper award at a conference, so I talked about how these sensors right now, if I have to make a soil moisture sensor or a soil electrical conductivity sensor, these sensors are still very expensive. They're a few hundred dollars, if not a thousand dollars. If you go to a farmer in India and tell them, hey, I have a technology for you, but it costs a few hundred dollars, they won't buy it. But, these, but many of them still have a smartphone. Even if it's an inexpensive Android phone, if they have a phone, smartphone, it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it. If it has a Wi-Fi chipset in it, the key idea was, well, the time of flight of a Wi-Fi signal depends on the permittivity of the material. So if I have right. this, if I turn on Wi-Fi, it's sending a signal, the time it takes to go from point A to point B depends on the permittivity of the material. What this means is that when the soil is moist, it will take longer to traverse the same distance. Right. So then the idea was, well, if we could measure the time of flight, we can use it to predict soil moisture and soil electrical conductivity. The challenge though, is that the time of flight is in nanoseconds. And with Wi-Fi, you really can't measure the nanoseconds based time frame right. because you don't have wide enough bandwidth. So then the key idea here was that most of these Wi-Fi chipsets have multiple antennas. So instead of measuring the absolute time of flight, you could measure the relative time of flight. And we came up with a physics-based method to do that. So now you can see this was the first paper that was published with this. But the vision here is that in the future, people could just bring their phones close to soil and start getting values. They could put it on a bicycle, drive around, and they have a map of the, of, of the entire farm. With that, you could really democratize sensing, right? So that's a vision that we are after. Of course, this is like the very first paper we wrote. We showed it to Bill Gates when he visited the farm. We have a demo farm here. He visited it 
he titled the the title of his blog he wrote on farm beats was can the wi-fi in the phone feed your world feed the world and we are super bullish about this future that you can really democratize sensing get every farmer everywhere to start using data because if they use data they can then use this data to be more productive that is they can grow more food they can be more profitable because they use less water less pesticide less nutrients they are also being sustainable in the sense that they are not wasting water they are not wasting pesticide so that's the vision of the future where that can help you address the food problem both in terms of the amount of food you grow making the farmers profitable as well as growing it in a sustainable way so i have a question bolt on question to that so when we talk about uh, see if i set up a, a phone network just for this phone uh we remember what motorola did and the company almost went bankrupt iridium network however why not uh, a company like microsoft or somebody else set it up more or less like a telco operation at the global wide and you put the sensors everywhere just like the antennas we are putting today and provide this as a service not just to the farmers it can be used even for calamities it can be uh for prediction predicting weather it can be used for even predicting uh the kind of uh fertilizer they should use hundreds of other data can be uh collected and the data can be sent why there is no company like that is it uh, the technology is not there or is the vision is not there it's a great business model and i think it will take off and now as you start making these systems more affordable i think this is a great opportunity for the audience of this <laughs> of uh, of this episode to see and think about these business models i think putting together such a telco network and in fact this leads to an interesting idea about agriculture as well that when you talk about rural areas they don't have great connectivity worldwide especially in, even in the us right if once you go outside the city you don't have great connectivity if you look at why don't you have great connectivity right because well for these network operators these isps they have very little incentive to put a tower when you have when your servicing say just 50 to 100 people because it's so sparsely populated but you can envision a future where these network operators are not just putting towers they are putting the sensors and they are providing agricultural services as well so then you are not just providing internet connectivity you are not just providing a pipe you are adding value on top of that pipe through these value added services like in this case it could be an agricultural service but i completely agree this this vision of having a network not just a network but network of sensors and devices and providing services on top i think that will happen in the future wow yeah, so right? and our audience have an opportunity that's so cool we found something very interesting for our audience this is impressive so ranveer let's talk about it say i want to do something like this and i want to do a small poc a proof of concept where do i start yeah i think there is this opportunity to go with say go in an area which has the most value right like for example whether you want to go with a forest or pick a pick an industry vertical i think it could be agriculture you could go with uh, say the high value crops and start with that let's go to grapes let's go to grapes let's go to wine industry because these yeah. are very temperamental and uh, right. it's huge and the right here in california in napa we have or sonoma we have amazing amazing crop and a lot of farmers and they invest a lot Uh, money is important but not so important when it comes to the quality of crop because it's a from $2 to $200 bottle of wine difference it's is huge so i wanted to start something like that in napa what do i do now yeah so you would so there are two different models one initial model you had was i put sensors and it's available to everyone that data that will probably not apply a lot in agriculture because in agriculture farmers care about their data they don't want to necessarily give their data because they have this trust issue that is if this data gets in the hands of other people they can squeeze you out of business it's a competitive advantage like if they know when did i apply water when did i apply fertilizer what fertilizer did i use if i used certain chemicals or did not use certain chemicals there's that there's that tension but assuming if you can filter out and provide that is you say that i won't give all the data out but i'll anonymize some of the data and give it out then that could be one way but it is effective i think talking about a service like what you mentioned you could have a network operator that says hey you know what i'm setting up these towers here and i'm going to be putting these sensors in your farm and this is a service you can access and this is the value this is like a subscription service based on the sensors that the network operator is putting there 
And then it's the additional value that the network operator can create and take a cut out of that. Say, suppose it can say that this is, it's, it's a concept which in agriculture, there's a new concept taking off called outcome-based farming, primarily oh. being pushed by the agriculture companies, which is- yeah, not Yeah, outcome so it is outcome-based farming, which is on, based on your outcome. That is, you not only buy my seeds, but based on how much it delivers, the yield that you get, you pay me a certain cut based on that. So you could see it's, while people are talking about outcome-based farming, part of it could be this network infrastructure, which could tell you, how do you meet that outcome? Similarly, you could start providing this service to the ag finance companies. You have banks that give out loans to these growers. With such a network, you could be monitoring, you could be giving the right advice, preventing damage, creating, doing the interventions at the right time. So you can start creating a lot of services. Based on this service, you could be providing a service to the growers and also acting as an interface to the seed companies, the chemical companies, the ag finance companies, the retail companies, the government. So that's the kind of a new business model that is ripe to be taken for data-driven agriculture. Right now, the model is that the grower is going to go, the farmer will go and invest in the technic technology in the farm. Instead of that, you could take this burden away. There could be an intermediary, which could be between the ag companies and the grower and providing services to both sides. It is in the interest of our government too. And when we talk about feeding 4 billion people, so I'm, I'm purely thinking and trying to connect all the dots around these. So the big challenge we have, it is uh, the water is the biggest problem. We, have, we don't have enough water, uh, clean water, to feed 4 billion more people. And if we continue to uh, waste the water, which we are doing today, it's going to be a bigger problem. So mm -hmm. the government's so interests are aligned. I need enough good quality food and as an infrastructure, I'm ready to put it like just the phone infrastructure people started putting in early 90s. And there was not, uh, we didn't have many subscribers, so the price was high. However, governments can uh, get engaged now and they, they should be involved, in my opinion, to fund some of these initiatives because in my opinion, it is no different than uh, tracking tsunami. We have sensors all over the world to detect tsunami. Why not for farming? I mean, this... Like, yeah. I don't understand that we talk about things, about calamity. So when we are dying, that's the only time we are reacting. When there is a real problem, we are not doing anything about it. Don't you see that as a problem? No, I agree. And this is, a, this is something I, when I go advise uh, governments, when I go talk to them in the US or in India, this is a point I bring up. Like the government has so many subsidies for agriculture. Like in India, they will subsidize your sprinkler system, your urea that you apply. Why can't they subsidize digital agriculture as well? Because this is the future. And this is something which I think is, is important uh, to subsidize digital agriculture as well. I love that term. Puneet, that is a perfect term. We should definitely talk about digital agriculture. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And I, I guess a, a lot of it depends on how educated the, the political classes or people who are going to take decisions are. And probably talking to people like you, Ranveer, they'll, they'll get to know more about what they can do because a lot of it is, could be, people might think that it's just in labs and, and they don't have practical applications. But as you have shown that these things have practical applications. Mm -hmm. uh, one other part I was thinking when you were talking about soil moisture and stuff like that, on West Coast, we are suffering with forest fires. I guess if you could have sensors that could tell you w which place is prone to getting fire because of low moisture in the air and hence the soil, you could just attack that part first and, and, and probably prevent such forest fires. And it has got a lot of uh, applications. Yeah, in fact, that's what I was coming to next when you when I was talking about when Sanjeev asked about where would you start. I think either you could start with high value crops or you could go with an industry with a vertical like forestry, where data sharing is not that much of a problem. You would want all this data for the kind of scenarios that you're mentioning, and it directly benefits the government. It would benefit the the, the forest companies as well. So definitely, that's another. I, I guess it can it can save billions of dollars for, for governments and and people and and especially when it comes to insurance and everything can be tied up with, with such data. So it's, it has a good future. It's just more education is, is needed and but probably anything, less cost too. Yeah. yeah and absolutely. you also have, Ranveer, you also have a team in India working on the same, right? Right. right. Um, we have on uh, Farm Beats. Is there anything different that you are doing for a low cost market? Yeah. So for the low cost market, this is still in research though, where 
the Wi-Fi based idea I mentioned using Wi-Fi to send soil, that's one thing for the emerging markets. Another thing we looked at was instead of drones, people use drones in the developed, in the developed world. Drones are expensive. They cost like thousand dollars. They have battery issues and they also have regulatory concerns. So the question was, if you, if you're not using drones, how can you get aerial imagery of a farm at very low cost? So the way we solved that problem was we're using helium filled balloons. These are balloons that you uh, like four to five feet in diameter. We built a mound where a farmer can put their smartphone with a camera facing down. It's tethered to the ground. You would just launch it up and you could start getting images of your, of your farm. You could walk around with it. And as you walk around, you get a complete, you can then stitch it together to create these ortho mosaics, these panoramic views of the farm, which then flows into the entire pipeline that we built for, uh, for farm beans. So we are continuing to bring these new technologies. Yeah. That, that's pretty good that you customize your, your uh, solutions to the, 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 the cost that can be borne by, by the market. That's pretty good. That's, that's what, that's what uh, frugal innovation that's required for, uh, for developing world like India. That's pretty good. Yeah, and we need to keep pushing the boundary because, you know, with, when people talk about climate change, the people who would suffer the most because of these climate change are these farmers, especially the smallholder farmers. They are not prepared for these untimely weather, for changes in what they've been doing for decades, what their uh, ancestors have been doing for centuries. So things change, they won't be able to adapt to it. So they need more help with technology. And I think it's, these are some of the things we are doing and all of us need to do a lot more to get them to start adopting these data-driven agriculture technologies. So I think and, Randy, and, the problem is not just the cost. Uh, when I look back in my career of last 25, 26 years in technology and working in the GIS, GPS space, uh, even car navigation, all those things, I did it way back in early, uh, late 90s, uh, designed the first uh, vehicle location system of Singapore. The challenge is not the cost, I find. It is just one part of it. The problem is how do you make it easy for people to understand and leverage. Because when you talk about $1,000, $2,000, $5,000 sensors, the value is not very clear. All we talk and I hear as a customer is a sensor. I don't hear the value. And that is the biggest challenge. Second problem I really see it is uh, people like us who are in technology, we don't really look at their problems. If we give them the answer, which is like the term people talk about is actionable insight. Okay, I have the insight, I have the data. What do I do with that? There is no action there. So that is a bigger problem. And that's where, when you said uh, people are concerned about sharing the data, answer is very simple to me and to them is, hey, if you don't share your data, nobody else is going to share the data, then there is no actionable insight. So you know about your soil, you know about your farm, and tomorrow there is something happening. You don't know. And that is where we can change the dialogue. And that's what happened when the telcos came in and they start installing these antennas and started changing the whole landscape of the city or uh, village. Yeah. And today, you and me both know it's phenomenal what communication has done. It's just unbelievable how this little phone has changed our lives globally. And I think we need to think more in terms of solutions. I completely agree with you. And to do that with data sharing, we need to build primitives so they, they feel more comfortable sharing the data, right? Because as you've seen, like the average size of farms, more and more farmers are getting away from farming because they don't make much money. Like even no. in the US, more and more farmers are, and not just in the US, even in India, when I look back to where I grew up in, in Bihar, a lot of the, my friends there are no longer in farming. They're all in big cities and they'll go pull a rickshaw, they'll do anything else, but they won't stay with agriculture. And I think we need to come up with a way where they feel that their profession is not under stress, is not under attack and they can share the data without any of that fear. Once we can build that mechanism, that's a technology problem too, but it's also, and once we do that, we need to start building the other thing you mentioned, which is more end-to-end -end services, telling them what is that actionable insight? What do you have to do? You just can't give them the data. You need to get them to do something on top. Yeah. yeah. So that's where the problem I lies, in my opinion, based on my personal experience when uh, uh, technologists like us, we talk about things, we say, oh, here is the data, but the poor guy doesn't know what to do with this data, okay? Oh, so have more water here, more fertilizer here. Oh, I have the wheat and I have the rice. It's just 
unbelievably, uh, it's very difficult for a farmer and who is used to of picking the soil and figuring it out what to do with this. So coming yeah, back. Yeah. Yeah. As technologists, I think we, we think of a future, and I've seen this enough, where we think of a future where we are going to replace a farmer. Food should just be grown wherever it is, right? A lot of people talk about a vision where, why do you need farmers in the first place? I have a farm in Iowa, I have my computer, I can remotely run my tractor there to get it to seed, get it to water, and I have the food that ships from there through robots. I'm personally not of that viewpoint. I feel there has to be a human element in farming. I somehow think that that adds that, that, that personal touch. With, like it's the same way, whether you trust a robotic doctor or you want to go to a human, I think it's the same thing with food, where I want that human touch. And if you want the humans involved, so this is a different technology problem. If you talk to technologists about the future, which is completely roboticized, this is somewhere less and not as sexy, like where you're saying, you know what, there's still humans in the loop. How do you make those humans more profitable? How do you make, you have to think about the farmer, you have to think about their profession and customize your technology problem for that. And for that, part of it is a cost, I agree with you, but the bigger thing is, how do you make it usable for these farmers? How do you add value? They would be willing to spend one lakh rupees in India if they can make two lakh out of it, right? So the point is, how do you get it to the point where it is, where the ROI is there for, for the crops? That brings to my other question, Ranveer. So we know the current land, size of the land, is limited. We can't cut more forest. Now I have to get more uh, crop or more uh, production from the same amount of land. We don't want to put more chemicals because by putting the more chemicals, we are completely imbalancing the soil and structure itself. And we have seen it time and time along that in India, we have completely ruined uh, land in like thousands and thousands of acres, not just one or two acres by either over fertilizing or putting the wrong crop or doing other things. And especially now we talk about pandemic. The biggest challenge people had was the food. Uh, I don't know about you, but I personally saw, actually it happened in Seattle, but I personally saw people were fighting in America over the bag of rice. I saw it with my own eyes. In fact, I picked a bag of rice because I had two and I gave it to one guy. I said, please don't stop, don't fight, it's okay. Uh, I mean, you know, I don't need much, but the problem I am seeing it is we have to think a food ecosystem completely differently. The challenge we have it is we are still, I agree with you on that note that we have to make uh, farming sustainable. We have to make uh, food almost zero carbon footprint or negative carbon footprint, but that's not going to solve the problem. In my opinion, we have to think uh, maybe vertical farming. Maybe we have to think of new kind of food because you don't want to cut more forest. I don't want to cut more forest. I don't want to put more chemicals in the soil. I don't want to uh, take all the clean water and use it for uh, growing the food. Uh, we talk about meat and it takes a lot of meat, a lot of water to produce a chicken, but uh, veggies are no different. I mean, we put a lot of... Uh, uh, so coming back to that is what you see as a future. And what are the other areas of innovation you see in terms of food production? Uh, is the future is going to be vertical farming or is the floating farm or is it going to be some other kind of food or we may be making that in a lab? Yeah, yeah. No, so that's the, the food is so fascinating, right? The way this entire industry is moving. And as you said about soil, just this morning, I was in a call with Professor Ratan Lal. He won the World Food Prize this year, which is like the Nobel Prize for Agriculture. And he was talking about how the soil in India has grown so bad that it's the improvement that you could get through using some good sustainable agriculture practices is going to be significant if you could do it in India. And so the, the challenge, as you mentioned, right, on the one hand, we don't have enough land and in that, how can we grow a lot more food without hurting the environment? And if I think of the future of food, I think of it in two ways. One is, of course, there'll be more visibility into the food that we grow, or the food that we eat. Like for example, if I'm consuming a certain amount of food, I should know exactly what it's going to be. Like one, it should be tailored to me. Who am I? And based on my, uh, my, my genetic constitution and what food I should be eating. But also I should know what is, how this food was grown, how this food was made, what is the calorific content of the food. So you'll have more visibility in the entire food supply chain, all the way from where it was grown, how it was shipped, where it was processed, what chemicals are added, 
to the time when it got to you and what you're eating. And that's one of the things which I think technology, things like blockchain, things like more like the sensing thing I talked about, things like a more transparent supply chain will address some, some of that. The other thing that's happening in food is, uh, as you said, right, there are these new technologies coming up like plant-based meats or vertical farming. People will grow food closer to you, close, like you might be growing your own food or you'll have it grown very close to where you are so that you're eating fresh food, say from vertical farms, these are farms grown in your garage or on a rooftop or farms, or you're eating food that is like, for example, lab-based, right? It doesn't have to be made in, uh, like you don't have to have actual cattle, actual livestock in order to eat your meat, in order to eat your food. In fact, to your point about water, I was just uh, uh, reading recently that for every calorie that you eat, you're, it, was, it uses one liter of water. Imagine wow. the amount of water that we are wasting if we continue to, not necessarily wasting, but the amount of water that is used to make the food that we eat. So how do you get it? Get it down? Calorie is one liter. Is one liter. So you can imagine how much water is being spent. Now, of course, not all food is the same. For potatoes, right, right. Like, potatoes, it's much less compared to, say, meat. If someone's eating beef, it's much, much, like, uh, I think it's 13 times the amount for the same number of calories that you get from potatoes. But that said, it is the problem of water, the problem of inputs of chemicals of soil is real. And we will need all the ways to, all different ways to grow food, including vertical farming. Because one of the other things with food is, it's not just about sustainability, but the nutritional value of the food is best within a few hours after it's been harvested. So if you can somehow make, if you can eat fresh food, you're going to be healthier. Now what that means is if I'm growing food closer to where I am, either most likely through vertical farming, I can then be eating much healthier food as well. It'll taste much better, it's better for my health. So that's a vision where we think to solve the food problem, it's, well, of course we need the land. We can't be growing everything indoors. We can't be growing everything in the lab. We, but in addition to that, we, we need to look at new ways in which we can address the food problem. There are, of course, challenges with vertical farming, challenges with lab-grown meat. It's different types of challenges. One is not sustainable, the other is not energy efficient, but these will get addressed and we need more, more innovation in each of these. Yeah, yeah I guess, Ranveer, uh, I feel that we need more data to educate the consumer as well, that if you're using, uh, if you're buying meat from this company, this is their rank in sustainability. I mean, this is how they grow their meat, things like that. It's just not organic and inorganic, but could just rank, just like you rank anything else, you could rank companies about how they are growing that particular product. So that'll be a yeah, good fact, way to educate people. Yeah, in fact, taking it a step further, Puneet, is like, yeah, you could rank companies, but why not take it to the next level where for every food that comes to you, yeah. you know where it was grown. Like it's just the data carries along yeah. with the food. Right? Like for example, any yeah. like a potato that was plucked or a cauliflower, it has certain data associated with it on what was done in the farm. And that data carries with it till the time it's yeah. appeared. So that would address the exact problem that you were mentioning. That is, yeah. So Randy, we are almost uh, to yeah. the end of our segment. Yeah. Uh, so I have one question I have for you. Do you just, have any for yeah, our audience? probably just. Sorry, Puneet. Do you have any challenge for our audience? Yeah, so I'm assuming a lot of the people in the audience are from IIT, are technologists, are really brilliant people uh, who study technology, who are changing the world in everything that you do. I would suggest people should, in addition to the work that you do, think about the food that you eat and how you could apply your work, your knowledge to change the food that we eat. Be it an aerospace engineer, who's building new planes, thinking about, you could be thinking about drones and robotics, be it a chemical engineer who's designing new, new chemicals and things that are on our table. The same ideas could be applied to food. And like in my own case, I think I was able to take that leap from computer science to agriculture. Although I know a lot of people in the audience have made that switch from agriculture to computer science, have become technologists. I was able to go the other way. But the big challenge I will put to everyone is 
to think in terms of food because food is intricate to everything who we are. We are what we eat and being able to uh, change that will make us more healthier, will help feed the planet, will help uh, the farmers do much better. So I think the impact that you can create by applying some of your research, some of your day-to-day -day work in the context of food could create huge impact. And if you have ideas, do feel free to reach out. I would love to just get on a call and chat and brainstorm. I'm extremely oh, passionate about food. Hundreds of those. <laughs> so uh, Ranveer, uh, I have only one more question. What role curiosity has played in your life? Yeah, that is very interesting because a lot of my work, at least before I moved to the product side, was very curiosity driven. No one really told me this is the problem that you work on. And that's one of the things I like in my role, in a science role, is you can pick your problem and then go after it. And a lot of my problems that like the TV white spaces or some of the battery work or farm beats was purely driven out of curiosity. And I think this thing, and the thing is we never stop learning. Like right? every day is, we are still learning new things. Like uh, every five years, that's why I start a longer term project purely based on curiosity and looking forward to learn in that space. Like I talked about 2005 was TV white spaces. 2010 was about batteries, a completely different theme. 2015, yeah. agriculture. 2020, I know it's here. One of the things I'm investigating is sustainability. Just understanding more and more about carbon, water, nitrogen, just trying to understand what is that balance and what can we bring as technologists. And a lot of it is the advice here for a lot of younger people who might be listening to this is you might, you will never have the complete knowledge, never be afraid to reach out to others who know more because it's this kind of symbiotic relationships that can really lead to big innovations and disruptions in this space. That's awesome. Thank you. And, uh, one more question I have, last question actually is, I promise. Where can we find, or our audience find more information about you? If they want to follow you, they want to learn the areas and things you are working on. Yeah, so please I request people follow me on LinkedIn, Twitter, or I have a uh, external facing web page as well. You could just go and you can I try to keep it updated. I haven't updated it in a while, but usually, usually I do post on LinkedIn or Twitter. If something comes up on the news feed, you'll see it there. But look forward to connecting to more and more people uh, in the audience as well. Connecting Thank to you, you, learning more, and working with others for listening. Thank, to you. This. Thank you very, very much for your time. Um, uh, it's just really phenomenal. Puneet, any last words? No, thank you very much, Ranveer, for taking the time out to talk to us. And I guess I'm pretty sure it'll be very educational for a Thank you, Ranveer. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah, thank you, Sanjeev.